This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, Thomas Philippon, who is a professor at uh, New York University in the Stern School of Business. Uh, also, also the author of this book uh, right here, The Great Reversal, How America Gave Up on Free Markets. So, welcome, Thomas. Thank you for having me. So, I teach a course uh, called Competitive Strategy, as you know. Uh, we teach it in every business school. And one of the things that I do at the beginning of the class is, <laughs> as I say, hey, you know, this course is built on, among other disciplines, industrial organization, right, which is a field that we kind of stole from economics. And the, the difference between the way we teach it in business school and the way we teach it in economics is that in the business school, we talk about how, you know, barriers to entry are good, right? And, uh, you know, suppressing competition is, is good. And, you know, uh, carving out su a sustainable competitive advantage that allows you to extract uh, profits, you know, this, this, is, this is what you're looking for. And Absolutely. over in the economics department, they have a little bit of a different view, <laughs> right, which is that, you know, that, that uh, you know, competition is, is what you want from a social perspective. And so there's this kind of push and pull where um, social welfare uh, benefits from, you know, putting a limit on these uh, rent-seeking activities. Um, but, you know, this is what we teach business folks to do. Now, I haven't spent a lot of time talking about the, the political tools that you can use to um, increase your, your rent capture, but, but it's, it's clear that f from a um, welfare perspective, right, there's some kind of sweet spot, right, where yep. we, we have an optimal amount of competition. I think your argument is that in the U.S., we were kind of close to that sweet spot when you arrived in, in 99 or certainly a lot closer to it. And in the last 22 years or so, uh, we've, we've kind of backed off of that. Now, now what, what I find really surprising and was really compelling about this book is that, you know, in the courses I teach, I, I talk about how, oh my gosh, the U.S. is so dynamic, right? If you look at the top 50 stocks in, in the S&P 500, you know, they change in every 12 years. And then you go over to France and you see the CAC 35, same old companies, right? And everything's stagnant. And, and your book, when you look at the data, however, that is really kind of anecdotal and it, it seems as if well no it's not like what you said was true yeah it's a, that i think it's just a but i i, I just want to go back to the way you framed the question which i think was uh excellent actually so i really like the way you uh, you introduced it as there's this fundamental tension which is we want we absolutely want business to try very hard to innovate their way out of competition mm -hmm. i mean that's what we want them to do and then the job of the regulators is to make sure they don't really get away with it for too long. <laughs> right. But it is this tension. This tension is at the heart of any modern uh, capitalist society. And um, it is a tension. Uh, it, but it's, it's meant to be one. It's not, it's, a, it's not a bug. It's a feature. Uh -huh. Which is we want that tension to be there all the time. And of course, that means that some, and then, you know, sometimes you dial up a bit too much to the left, sometimes too much to the right. And the question is, can you stay somewhere in, near the sweet spot? And the argument in the book was, yeah, exactly as you said, like, I, I believe that somewhere in the, you know, uh, 1990s, the US was quite close to the sweet spot. And that over the following 20 years, um, it's been a bit too lenient. And, get it, and letting businesses get away with too much. Um, mm -hmm. And so not surprisingly then, we see some tendency today of trying to shift the balance back, um, but it's not easy as we, as we see. And, and you point out that Europe now is sort of the, you know, Europe has copied the US playbook and the US has sort of forgotten, right, what, what made it, you know, such a, such a, uh, such a great place uh, economically. Um, now, I, I used to teach a course called Business History um, many, many years ago when I was on the East Coast. And, and the kind of narrative was that, you know, business is always looking for a comfortable place, right? And yep. that the story, the political economy story is one where, you know, businesses use the political system to, to carve out a, a, a nice, safe zone. And that, um, you know, antitrust laws and, uh, and other policies e exist to kind of prevent them from, and, and there's this Mansur Olson story that you, you, you lean on uh, quite a bit. And, and I'm a big fan of Mansur Olson, which at the end of the book, you say that all great empires kind of 
you know, collapse uh, due to some kind of sclerosis. And, and, uh, and that's really the Mansur Olson story. So, so why is, what, what happened in 2000? Like what, what is the, what, what, what do you think is the underlying cause? Well, let's dig it. We'll dig into sort of what's happening, but I'm really interested in kind of what, you know, what changed. Cause it doesn't seem like there was any kind of underlying change in the political process in the U S. Yeah. So, um, I mean, the big picture is that if I, if I look at, so first we need to, uh, you know, kind of have a sense of what are the main indicators that we're looking at. So uh, we look at um, how much money our firm's making. So we take, compute some kind of profit margin and then the profit margin of a business or of actually the, the entire corporate sector for the US is exactly an example of the tension, which is if it's too low, the firms are not making money, that's bad. Um, if they're making too much money, that means the worker are not making as much as they should mm-hmm. because you know at the end of the day, that's the same pie. So GDP is one number, and then if firms take uh, more than 30% of the total income, that means the worker gets less. Okay, um, And so we want to find um, that sweet spot where the profit margin is more or less in, you know, in line with incentives, but not too high. And historically, um, that hovered around some numbers, not that by useful to compute it, but um, if you look at after-tax profits for corporations in the U.S., today they are at an all-time high. They are higher than mm-hmm. they've been at least uh, since we have uh, data to record it. Um, and the share going to labor has been lower. Um, so that's one indicator. Uh, the one you mentioned earlier was um, some some idea of business dynamism, um, which is, I mean, the simplest way to think about it is how much reshuffling, how much turnover is yeah. there at the top. So you can do something like take the pick your favorite number, maybe you could say 100, pick the 100 largest stocks in the US and ask yourself how many who are today in, in the top 100, how many have been there for a very long time? So say, take that to be 10 years. And what you see is that if you look at the largest 100 stocks in the US in the 1990s, roughly less than half had been in the top 100 for 10 years in a row, uh, something like 45 out of 100. If you do the same calculations today, you would find that it's more like 75%. Okay, so there's less churning at the top. The, the top firms tend to stay there longer than they used. They also have higher market shares. So that, that you know, if you bring all these pieces together, they make a lot of money. They don't seem to be challenged as much as before, and their market shares are large and stable, then it suggests that perhaps they are not being challenged, they are not being challenged as much as they used to. That's I think is true. And more importantly for me, I think they are not being challenged as much as they should. So we are not mm-hmm. at the sweet spot. So now if you follow this, suppose you follow all this uh, kind of data, then things start to change somewhere late 90s, early 2000. It's not necessarily like an abrupt change. So you can't just pinpoint that is one event that triggered the change. Um, but if you look at these uh, various kind of indicators, or kind of measures we can come up with, then they pretty much all shift around the year 2000. So I think as a date, it's not bad. Now, if you look behind and try to figure out what's going on, I think that one issue is that there might be several um, underlying trends and they might not all play out at the same time scale. So one that, if you focus on antitrust enforcement and, and things like that, then most scholars would go back to the 1980s and a shift between a way of thinking of competition towards a more less fair approach that people associate with the Chicago School of Antitrust, which really builds on the idea that markets are self-correcting. So you don't need to worry about dominant firms, firms that dominate an industry, because market forces are such that they cannot dominate for very long. Because if they make money, they're going to attract new entrants. The entrants are going to come in and compete with them and compete their rents away. So that's kind of the basic idea. That idea started to grow and influence policy, uh, but that did not change abruptly in the 2000s. It's something that was underlying. Um, so that's kind of one extreme of a time scale which is slow moving. Then you have the other extreme, which is like a one-off event. So that's more like for a foreign industry. So I can give you one example. In 2000, there were still eight major airlines in the US. Today, there are four. Okay. 
Um, that happened via a succession of, of mergers, but they happen in a very short time span, something like six years. Um, for, I think it's fair to say that at least one or two of the initial mergers were motivated by what happened post 9-11, which is you know, dramatic you know, shock to air travel. Um, some airlines got into trouble because of that, and so it actually made sense maybe to move from eight to seven so they could consolidate and maybe a bit more efficient and make a little bit more money to recover from the 9-11 shock. Um, the problem is, of course, that we didn't stop at seven. We went mm -hmm. seven to six, six to five, five to four, and today it's very concentrated in a way which is not efficient. So my point here is that you have different elements and then um, that not all of them play out at the same time scale. Somewhere in the middle between, let's say, one event with a specific date and a very slow moving trend, I think you have the political economy where measures of um, you know, business lobbying, trying to influence like the cost of uh, running a political campaign, the amount of money businesses pay uh, for both for um, local election, state election and federal elections, mm -hmm. that start to increase sharply around 2000. So that's also approximate cause. Well, I, I think one misunderstanding that most people have is that, you know, they think that um, if you're trying to foster competition, th this boils down to a question of more versus less regulation. And I think, you know, you highlight that sometimes regulation, the way we understand it, can be competition enhancing and sometimes it can be competition suppressing, right? Well, oftentimes so, it is suppressing. Yeah. Actually, yes. No, no, I'm not, so, I'm not so a big fan of regulation in general, um, right? But I do think that some of them are very useful. Right. Um, I mean, like there's plenty of regulation that are just pushed by lobbies because that's a way to protect their rents. So anything that smells like a numerous clauses where you just limit the number, um, that's bad regulation. Um, you have plenty of uh, barriers to entry in, in at the state level, usually in the U.S. actually on various types of jobs where you need uh, to have a license. So licensing is. Uh, like one of the favorite game that uh, lobbyists use to create barriers to entry and therefore protect the incumbent. So all of these, uh, often, most, more often than not, they are bad regulations. But then, you, on the other hand, you have regulation that says, uh, thou shall not uh, create a cartel to raise prices. Well, that's a regulation. Obviously, that's what we want to keep. That's one when everybody agrees on that. And then in the middle, you have, what do we do with firms that are dominant. And then the one thing to understand, I think, especially for people listening, is it's up. So in the US, the, the big idea of actually antitrust is not that complicated if you boil it down to simple idea. The idea is it is absolutely okay to become dominant as long as you do it by being better than your competitors. So if you become really good by being better than your competitors, it's fine. There's nothing that we, that we would do against you. Um, but you cannot become dominant by using anti-competitive actions. Um, and of course, where you draw the line, what's competitive or not, that's, that's tricky. But it's okay for firms to innovate their way out of competition. In fact, we want them to do that. Um, now, regulations that worry about firm dominance, then they're always in this gray area, which is you have to decide, well, was it anti-competitive or not? Is it too much of a good thing at the end when a firm dominates too much? And, and it's not, and the answer is usually murky. Okay, it's always gray, it's never black or white. Um, and so that's why it's also, to some extent, harder to maintain the sweet spot. Okay, because if, 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 if it's black and white, at some point, it's not that hard to decide. If it's gray, then, you know, you could get carried far away from the sweet spot by lobbyists who argue that, no, not really, it's gray, but it's fine, so don't do anything. Um, now, the good thing is sometimes, oftentimes, even the market solves the problem. Um, so in the, the book, I give the example of Walmart, which is um, an amazing achievement uh, as a company who you know, was tiny in the late 70s and then went on to get about 60% market share of their uh, industry um, by the early 2000s. So that's just mind-blowing. But what's interesting when you look at the growth of Walmart is that as they were getting market share getting bigger and bigger, um, their profit margins were very flat. In fact, in the aggregate of Walmart was slightly decreasing. Um, if you do product by product, it was more like flat. So mm -hmm. what that means is that the firm was getting more efficient. That's how they 
uh, acquired market share in various markets. They expanded geographically and they became much larger. But um, And they did that by innovating, by innovating on the supply chain, on the use of IT to manage inventories and stuff like that. Many of the innovations that everybody uses today, Amazon and all the other competitors, were actually pioneered, many of them pioneered by uh, Walmart. But what's interesting is that the fact that the profit margin of Walmart was stable over this expansion, what's telling you is that every 1% increase in efficiency they achieved via their IT investment ended up being passed on as a 1% lower price for the consumer. Okay, that's how you can maintain, you become more efficient, but your profit margin become, remains stable. So that's kind of good. Now, it's still the case that by the early 2000s, there was much discussion in Washington that Walmart was getting too large. And there were attempts to rein in the growth of Walmart. Okay. Um, not very successful. Um, maybe it could be that we would have seen more actions um, later, but it didn't need to happen because the magic of capitalism worked in that case, which is right at the time where we worried a lot about Walmart becoming too dominant, some unknown firm appeared on the screen called Amazon, and that's it. Then brought back the competition, and since then, <clears throat> arguably, the retail sector in the U.S. is pretty competitive, definitely very efficient. <clears throat> so in a sense, the market solved the problem, and this is the way we want it to be. So you know, mm-hmm. I think even regulators, by and large, would prefer not to have to intervene. The question is, what do you do if you, know, you wait and nobody shows up as a competitor, and you wait more, and there's still nobody? Now, at some point, you have to do something. And that's where uh, it gets tricky. And that's, I think, the situation where we are in many of these markets. Well, look, there's one view of antitrust, which I think you've articulated, which is that um, there's nothing wrong with large firms, right? That's you can be sure. large and contribute to competition and efficiency, like Walmart did. Or you can be, be large and prevent competition. And so antitrust is about distinguishing between those two. But isn't there an entirely different idea of antitrust that you want to prevent size because you're concerned about the the feedback with the political system, right? And that, you know, size can lead to disproportionate influence in in politics, which can then flow through to reduce competition. Yeah, so that's the the view that's usually um, associated with uh, Louis Brandeis. Mm -hmm. And... um, it has some, of course, it has some validity. I think that um, for people like me, um, we would still react by saying that antitrust is the wrong tool. So in other words, we would say, yes, this is absolutely a valid point. So you have to worry about the political power of very large terms. So we agree with the premise. Um, we just don't think that antitrust is the right tool to address that question. So it's, it's like a second best, right? It's like if you have no other way of preventing that sort of corruption in politics, then, then maybe that's, that's a tool you would use. But there might be other ways of That's exactly of right. That's exactly right. It's, it's really saying like you, are, you should be fixing that thing in other ways. But if you're so dysfunctional and, and, and incompetent that you can't fix it uh, in the normal way, then you, you know, if the only tool you have is antitrust, you end up running on antitrust. So I, you know, so of course... If that was really true, that there was absolutely no other way of doing it, then maybe I would even eventually side with the people who have that view. I just think it's it's not a view that you should, you know, um, accept lightly in a country like the U.S. I mean, in other words, that's setting the bar pretty low in my in my view. Like we should, you know, it would still be. I mean, in a country like the U.S., you should still identify a problem and try to best the, to use the best tool to fix that problem. As opposed to say, well, everything is dysfunctional except antitrust policy, and therefore I'm going to use it for everything. Mm-hmm. Because um, A, I don't think it's going to work very well, and B, I think it's going to distract antitrust cases from doing what they're actually supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Um, now, look, so, there, you know, but I mean, it's an open debate, and obviously some people would disagree with that. Now, look, there, there are alternative explanations, and I think you articulate all of them, <laughs> or most of them, in, in the book for the phenomenon that you observe, right? So if we see um, larger scale, if we see more concentration, if we see uh, higher profit margins, I mean, couldn't this just be explained by 
economies of scale, right? And and so particularly in information intensive industries, right? It's obvious that there are economies of scale and scope, right? Particularly in in the world of of data. So so why what do we how do we respond to the to the folks who would say, well, you know, this is just you know, every story is like the Walmart story, right? You know, every example of greater concentration is just an example of, you know, business people, right, doing what they do and doing it really well and, uh, you know, figuring out uh, better ways of, of, of running businesses. Okay, so I think that's the, that's the heart of the matter. So, um, again, just to be very clear, so nobody, especially not me, would think that the world is, you know, a one-story um, tagline. So there is always technology and uh, business dynamism and regulations, and they all interact. And the only question is, are we, are we getting the right balance? So um, with respect to what has, we've seen over the past 20 years, I want to make... So the, the answer that people give, which is, yeah, but information, economies of scale, therefore you expect large firms and nothing to see there. So my main issue with that is that um, I've noticed uh, writing the book that the people who say that confidently are usually the people who know the least about the data. And that's a telltale sign that they are saying it not because they have any insight, just because they are repeating what they've heard. So the first point is that many of the issues today in high, with high prices have nothing to do with IT. So I think there's a problem in the telecom sector. I think that, um, I don't think, as a matter of fact, Americans are paying at least twice as much as uh, citizens of other nations, other rich countries, um, for their cell phone plans. That has nothing to do with economies of scale. Um, same thing with uh, broadband internet. You know, when I was here, um, when I arrived as a student uh, in the you know, early, late 90s, early 2000, around 99, 2000, um, access to internet at home was much cheaper in the US than mm-hmm. anywhere in Europe. And that was actually because of deregulation and because of competition. Because the, the key point was that local calls were free in the U.S. So um, if, you, if you were within a small re- area around your home, you could call for free. Now, that didn't sound like much, but once we started using Internet with dial-up modems, where you would actually need to be um, you know, making a call that would last an hour just to be able to download data, suddenly the fact that the data was free, that made a huge mm-hmm. difference. Okay. And so the U.S. had the most competitive and cheaper access uh, to Internet, uh, circa 2000, compared to all the rich nations. You fast forward 20 years and things are exactly reversed. Like, but not by a small margin. I'm not talking about 5%. I'm talking about a change of factor of 2 or 3. So in Paris today, it would cost you less than half of what it would cost you in New York City to get <clears throat> uh, the same speed of, of broadband access. And for your cell phone plan, it's even less than half. Okay, it's not. So these are whatever explanation you might come up with before was still true. Like the geography of the U.S. has not changed. Like nothing has changed. What has changed is the degree of competition. So these are not IT sectors. These are, you know, of course, technological sector. But everything is technological in today's society. Mm-hmm. But there is no nothing special about that. And this, I think, is where the big uh, issues are. We also have many examples of higher concentration in market uh, that have, that have no, no connection whatsoever with IT. Like, you know, think about in, uh, in the mid-processing business that you know, mm-hmm. we, we talked about the last year. That's, that's not IT. So the first point is that if you look at um, what actually costs a lot of money to people, like expenses that hit them every month, um, where I would argue prices are too high in the US, most of the examples you're going to come up with have nothing to do with data or information technology. So that's the first point. So let's fix these guys. Okay, let's fix this. I think to some extent also true in the um, energy market. To some extent, I think uh, you know, like the uh, I think the energy bills and, and many um, providers of energy, gas, uh, propane, heating oil. That, that market is not very competitive either. Very very not transparent. And then on top of it, of course, you have the healthcare system. But that, let's yeah. talk about that later, because if you go into healthcare, then it's going to be even more murky. So let's, let's, right. let's leave healthcare for now. So first point is that there's a lot to do in the non-information technology space. And in fact, if you want to 
um, have an impact on people's living standard is probably more important because for all the blames we can make, you can address to towards Google or Facebook, you know, at, most people don't pay for these services directly. Okay, mm -hmm. so then you have the second question is, okay, what about the IT system? So there, yes, of course, it is absolutely true that these firms are successful because they are good. So like mo vastly, the, the, the vastly more important explanation for why they are big today is because they were better, okay? But that's true actually throughout history. In fact, it was true of Standard Oil. You know, like people say, oh, but we were not, like Standard Oil was the robber balance and stuff. Well, actually that's another example of people who say that casually don't really know what they're talking about. Standard Oil was a very innovative company. That's how it became also so successful. You know, in fact, there are very, very, very few examples in the US of a company that became large and successful without being really good and better than its competitors. So that's that's normal, that's what we want. But that doesn't change the question that once they reach a certain scale and they start using anti-competitive means to maintain their dominance, that's when the trouble starts. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's how you should frame it. Now, the last thing is economies of scale. Well, if you actually try to measure them, you'll find that they are not that different from before. So, uh, Take uh, industries that have been important for a long time, chemical industry, pharmaceutical industry, the ratio of fixed to marginal cost or marginal to fixed cost, if you want, uh, it's not that different from the Google of the world. I mean, if you if you develop a new drug, it's all fixed cost. And so, you know, the idea that scale, um, that return to scale explain the change of today, that is a story that you can tell, but you actually put some hard numbers on it, you'll see that the change if any, actually. The, I tried measuring it with um, uh, Harman Gutierrez. We actually found no trend. So the return, the average degree of return to scale in the US economy was pretty flat over the past. But even if we measure a little bit wrong, and it's a little bit up, it's nowhere near large enough to explain some of the dynamics. In other words, yes, they are return to scale, but you could easily have two or three Facebook and two or three Googles and two or three of all of these guys, and it would still be fine. They would still reap the benefits. One example of that, I think, is still the retail. Let's go back to retail. Amazon has a lot of competition, and it's doing fine as far as I can tell. You know, but if you if you take Walmart, Costco, and Amazon, so yes, they are all very big. So each of them individually uh, achieves the return to scale. But there is a huge difference between having one and having three. So my main point is that even if you buy into the return to scale story, you can still have two or three main, main players buy industry, and that's doesn't get you to full competition, but nobody thinks we're going to get to the full textbook mm -hmm. style competition. But I think three, four is a lot better than one. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to say that when I read the book, it really did make me think more carefully about comparing prices in U.S. and, and Europe, right? Because I think retail is something that, that's very salient, right? So, you know, you have your European friends come to America and they're like, oh, look at all this stuff that I can buy. It's super cheap and, you know, take it back to Europe and you go to Europe and you see everything's expensive. And so so I think, you know, the, the prominence of, of, of retail makes makes you think that, that everything's doing really well in the U.S., and all it takes is just a, a, a shift to these other areas, just a shift in, in focus to these other areas. I was in um, France uh, skiing a couple of years ago, and I, and I got an infection on my leg. And I remember going into the private medical uh, uh, clinic, and for sixty-five dollars, right, had uh, you know the doctor uh, pay attention to me and, and provide me with the right treatment and, and care. And, and I was thinking this would probably be about. Eight thousand yeah. dollars, right? I think no, no, that's true. I, the, you know, I, I had a concussion in the U.S. and, and I think I got a bill for eighty-five thousand dollars for one hour, you know, in, in the in the uh, in the emergency room, and and uh, and so I think th these 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 industries which have figured out a way to uh, jack up prices, uh, they're, they're they're ones that that sort of you know, we, we don't think about as much, right? And and I think that when you tell the story about how when you came to America, like everything was cheaper and now things are, are often more expensive, um, that that's something I think that people need to have pointed out to them because it's not immediately obvious unless they do travel. True. And it's very important to, uh, like, selecting the control group is, is very important and very tricky. And to some extent, that's why you need the economists like me to do, try to do it because for most people, it would be quite hard. The main reason is, the fact that um, wages are higher in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and in some profession a lot higher. So you give a healthcare as an example, 
your average doctor in the US probably earns twice as much as your average doctor in, in France. Um, mm-hmm. Not like 10% more, but probably like literally twice as much. Now, why? Well, first of all, medical school is expensive here. Uh, in Europe, a lot of uh, education is not free, but very cheap because it's paid by uh, by the state, essentially. Mm-hmm. And so you don't have to pay back your medical school. So, of course, now the question, yeah, but if you pay for medical you know, if you pay for the medical school via your taxes, then you're paying di- indirectly the healthcare cost that later mm-hmm. is going to show up in wages in the US. So you have to adjust for all of that. And that's difficult, okay? Which is why you need economists to try to do it carefully. Um, so in the book, I try to select a few cases where arguably uh, the wage component is relatively small. So, you know, providing, and the technology is similar. So that's why I think like the price of, uh, having a cell phone plan. You know, you have a smartphone, you have your iPhone or your Android, you uh, you want to have unlimited data and texting and stuff like that. How much does it cost here versus there? The wage effect is at most would explain 10% of the difference mm-hmm. because this industry is that, you know, at the end the cost is not that much via the wage. Um, and if you find a difference in price, which is like 250%, and you know that at most 10% comes from uh, the wage difference, then you know that the bulk of it is just market power. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's easy in some cases, and even there, it's more tricky than it sounds. Like, see details in the book if you want to really get into the nitty gritty detail. Um, but that, but that's why it's important to try to make the comparison um, on a you know taking into account mm-hmm. changes in the structure. And the main difference again is the level of the wages. So, for instance. You would never expect restaurants to be the same price in New York City as in Paris because wages are lower in Paris. So restaurants are heavily dependent on wages or a big fraction of their cost is labor cost. Therefore, all else equal, they would have higher prices in New York than in, than in Paris, even at the same level of competition. Um, so it's always you adjust for that and then you try to make the difference. Now, in the case of healthcare, I think that wages is a big part of it. But people who've done the studies carefully show that most, not all, okay, but most of the price difference into what consumers pay for health services is prices, is is uh, markups, not um, different mm-hmm. wages. But it's not all of it. Mm-hmm. Now, look, I think some of the data that you point out isn't immediately disturbing, such as higher concentration, higher profitability, because that's not necessarily inconsistent with optimal efficiency. But when you dig deeper and you look at sort of investment, when you look at productivity, right, when you, when you look at um, uh, capital formation, that's when things I think uh, really start to, to look, look disturbing, right? So, so yeah, that's how I I started also. The the book is is written uh, in what I think is a logical order, but the way I Uh got into it, is actually much more convoluted than actually I started with investment because that's more my training as a micro guy. I, I, I study investment dynamics. And that's the first time I started thinking about concentration and markups and market power was because of investment actually. Mm-hmm. And the basic Great. theory of investment says that um, if I give you funding costs and profit margins and some idea of the you know how long you're margins are going to persist over time, then I should be able to predict how much you invest. The idea is very simple. If you know, if you make a lot of money from what you're doing, and if your funding costs are low, well, you should do more of it. You know, like you just literally scale up and make even more money. So that's that's the basic theory of investment. Then there is a whole theory of how you measure these things, and in, there's a bunch of uh, very interesting that I try to explain in the in, in the book. It's a bit geeky. So I have boxers to explain the technical part, but it's, I think it's kind of cool that it turns out in some cases you can literally use stock market valuation to mm-hmm. construct exactly the measure that would predict investment. And um, so it's a, you know it's kind of the kind of research we do in, in macroeconomics. And if you do that, you find it works pretty well. But then starting around 2000, you have this kind of discrepancy that starts to appear, which essentially says that given the conditions we observe in the market, given how much money firms are making, given how the market value the firm. So they are telling you the markets think that these margins are going to persist over time. And, of, and given the funding costs that the firms experience, uh, we should expect them to be investing more than they actually uh, did. 
And so this gap here, this residual that we don't really understand, is what started me thinking about these issues. And I found that at least part of that uh, missing investment is because some of the valuation we see in the market reflect increasing market power by the firms. Mm -hmm. It's priced in the stock. Um, so you observe high valuation. You know, monopolies typically have, if anything, lower funding costs. So then you, if you take the standard perspective, say, well, this firm should be investing more because the stars are aligned. They are making money. They could, they could scale up easily with, at, at low cost. Why don't they do it? Well, they don't do it because the very reason they appear profitable is because they, they have uh, market power and rents, and they know that if they scale up, they would push their markups down, and they don't want to do that. So they, they restrict supply, if you want, by not investing as much as they should. So right, so it's the, it's, the, it's the deadweight losses that we're concerned about, right? Yes. I mean, there's, there, you, could, you could produce more and sell it at a price that's higher than your marginal cost, and you could invest more, right, potentially, but that's not happening because of these, these frictions. So uh, I think, you know, if we switch to the political story, and, and it's, I think the political story is, is really the, the, but I should mention also that, you know, the book, <laughs> apart from telling the story, it offers incredibly concise explanations of all of the concepts that you and your colleagues work on, right, in, in macroeconomics, you know, understanding Tobin's Q, <laughs> right, right, uh, understanding uh, the, the, the specifics of international trade, of how CPI is calculated, all of that stuff. It's, it's really awesome just as a, a primer on, on those concepts, I should say. But when we turn to the political story, right, you know, one view of, of lobbying and of political campaigning is, you know, you could construct a story where uh, these political marketplaces also operate efficient, efficiently, right? Mm -hmm. Where the, you know, the willingness to pay is, is revealed through how much you're willing to contribute to this Absolutely. political marketplace. And therefore, if, you know, the willingness to pay is higher, that's presumably because, you know, you, you benefit more. And, and so, you know, why doesn't that work, right? So we think about the imposition of a tariff, right? And we know that this tariff is going to reduce the size of the pie. Then, then we should think that the people who are harmed by this would be willing to sort of, you know, contribute more to prevent it from happening than the, the people who are benefiting from it would be willing to contribute to, you know, to get it, get it approved. So, you know, I mean, there's the Mansur Olson story, of course, right, which is, you know, at the heart of this. But, but you know, what, what, is, what are the frictions in that political marketplace? You know, are they insurmountable? Are, are, they, are they inevitable? I mean, I think, you know, Olson's story is that the, the longer you go with kind of a system of political stability, the more time these interests have to, to organize, and, and therefore the, the, the more likely it is that the concentrated interests will ultimately prevail. Is, is, is that just a story? Like, we just had this period of relative stability, and that's what's allowed for the, the, the organization of these, these concentrated interests? So that's possible, actually. That's, uh, I don't really... So that would be like an even more ambitious uh, a kind of academic research agenda, which I'm thinking about. But so is it the case that, you know, uh, we've had too many... A little bit maybe like the cuckoo clock story in The Third Man. I don't know if you guys are... I'm a movie geek, so I like Orson Welles. But there's this famous line in The Third Man where... Um, you know, Orson Welles is making fun of Switzerland. So he, say, he says, in Italy, we had, uh, uh, talking about the Renaissance in Italy, and, and we had, like, mass murder, families killing each other with poison, usually, actually, uh, the Borgias in particular. Uh, so very bloody. And the outcome of that was the Renaissance and Michelangelo. And, <laughs> and then he says, but in Switzerland, we have 500 years of peace and democracy, and what do we get? The cuckoo clock. <laughs> so you know, yeah, there's, there might be some some truth to that, but I, I I do believe that maybe it is true that the selection of political players changes a little bit when um, it becomes fully professionalized. Mm -hmm. Like you know, after after usually after big events, wars or revolution or like really big tragic events, then the the political leaders are the ones who did well during this crisis. And to some extent, uh, they did it because they believed it, and at least they had the courage of their opinions. 
Um, now, if after many years of, of peace and, uh, and democracy, maybe we only select the people in political office who are like professional politicians, and maybe it's not exactly the type of people that you would like in an ideal world. So that's possible. But, uh, you know, uh, without going that far, um, I, again, I very much like your framing, which is that there is no reason to think that lobbying uh, is bad um, in and of itself. And in fact, there is no reason to think a priori that the political system um, is not, you know, operating like any market. You have supply, demand, competition, and, you know, it's not obvious that the outcome is going to be bad just because we call that politics, you know. Um, and in fact, you know, in the past, there's plenty of um, examples. I mean, one example that historians have been looking at, which that takes it a little bit far from the book, but I think it's relevant. Um, why is it that... Um, the Industrial Revolution happened in Europe. Well, one explanation that's been pushed by people like Joel Mokey at, at Northwestern is precisely that there was political competition in Europe. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, there, you, there was never in Europe one monarch ruling over the entire continent who could suppress ideas. Um, they could, and they very much did, in their own little kingdom. But if mm -hmm. an idea was really good, and then you try to suppress this in your kingdom, then the idea would just migrate. Sometimes, literally, with the person in, who had the idea, would just you know, pack up and go and move somewhere else. And they, or, or a bad or a bad idea like Columbus, right? as well. Yes, but so that's why um, in Europe there was no way to suppress uh, innovation, um, and the competition between the Netherlands and France and the UK, Spain meant that if somebody had a good idea that would be disruptive and vested interest would try to kill it, well, if the idea was good, it would, it would show up somewhere else. Um, and that's probably part of the reason that Europe, which was pretty backward until the 1500s, definitely, you know, in terms of technology, was behind China. And yet, the big ideas for the next transformation happened in Europe, not, not anywhere else. Uh, and I think it's because, um, I mean, Descartes, uh, left France because the French were so annoying that he couldn't let him walk and he went he, he went north, you know, and Spinoza did the same. And then, so I think that's, there is some truth to that. So the, now in the US, of course, uh, you could sometimes, you could apply that to at the state level. So it is true that states compete with each other and uh, sometimes it's for the better in the sense that, um, you know, if you don't like the regulations or the way your state is run, you can move to another state. Now, it's costly, so, you know, it's not perfect. But I think that's an important dimension. Well, that's what we – well, we see that at corporate law, right? So all the companies move to Delaware because it's got, you know, much more attractive corporate law. Yeah, exactly. But then the question is, uh, is does it create a race to the top or a race to the bottom? And I think in yeah. practice we see both. Like Delaware is a prime example. There's no question that they are – like the level of competence is higher there. So there's, a, there's an argument that it's really because they are better that they attract. Of course, it's also because they are maybe more lenient. Um, and the same thing with state subsidies. So st states, if states compete on the merit by having better universities, you know, uh, better infrastructure, that's great. If they compete by doling out subsidies to attract businesses, that's less great, okay? And so I think, that's a perfect example of there is no reason to think the political system will always be bad. It's a marketplace. And after all, you know, it could deliver good outcomes just like markets do in general. But it could fail for the same reason markets fail. And usually it's because people are ill-informed or, or because uh, entrenched interests that they have so much power that it's hard to move them. So I think these are the, 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 the key building blocks. Now, with respect to lobbying, it's the same story. So you, a lot of lobbying actually is a form of expertise. Um, yeah. And if a business feels very strongly about something and they lobby a lot about it, well, there's a good presumption that it's because it does matter. And so, yeah, so we, th so we think of like the, their views. So if you think of like the notice and comment process, right? So exactly. when you have proposed legislation, Absolutely. right, the, any interested party can come forward and, and kind of say, hey, I remember this whole hap with, with Dodd-Frank, right? So when Dodd-Frank was originally proposed, and I, I had played a little bit of a part in that, the, the, what happened was, um, you know, the, the, the finance industry said, hey, wait a second, you know, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. And, and so the information provision part of, of that process is one that I, I don't think anybody would, would have a problem with. It's just impossible to disentangle, right, the, 
the information provision from the you know, I mean, people aren't going to advance information that's not in their exactly. best interest, right? But, that, but that's, that's great because see, now you put your finger on exactly the, the reason why, uh, not the reason, maybe one of the main reasons why there could be a market failure in politics, which is uh, mm-hmm. the issue of information. Information is not at all. A market economy functions well when information is more or less evenly spread between buyers and sellers. Um, in the case of lobbying, it is unlikely to be true because when you ask for comments, you're going to get comments from people who know, so they are very likely to be industry insiders. The problem is they possess both the language and the incentive to tilt the outcomes in their favor. So you cannot trust, you cannot take at face value what they're going to say. And so that's the root of the problem. And to some extent, political systems are very much like that because it's almost built in, if you think about it, because the reason we elect officials is precisely because we don't have the space in our brain to deal with all of the issues. We elect people to, t- to take care of it. That's their job. So we can go, go you know, about and think about our business. But as soon as you do that, that means you will never have the full information. And therefore, it's possible for uh, players to take advantage of their insider knowledge and insider power to tilt the outcome in their favor. And so the political game of lobbying is always, just like any market, trying to find the balance between these two. And you know, the argument in the book is that I think perhaps it's tilted a bit too much uh, over the past 20 years toward being lenient toward, uh, toward businesses. And the funny thing is in Europe, to some extent, happened the other way, mostly because my reading is kind of a forward fumble. I'm not sure it was really planned. But it did happen that way. Mm-hmm. Well, so what about in political campaign contributions? So clearly the cost of this campaigning has kind of skyrocketed and the politicians spend most of their time soliciting funds and, of course, funding purchases, access, and so forth. And, and I know in the book you spend a lot of time trying to look for empirical evidence of quid pro quos, and it's kind of hard to find, right? There's endogeneity problems that I think you, you articulate really well. But, but it seems like, I mean, wouldn't it be in the interest of industry in general to sort of price fix this process, right? I mean, it seems yeah. like if, if, you, if, you can, if companies can get together and, and agree not to advertise, right, that's the classic example, then the entire industry would, would benefit. So if, if, if the, all the lobbyists could somehow agree to, you know, price caps <laughs> of some kind to kind of get rid of the, this arms race, it, it, would, it would seem to benefit industry. But when you look at the numbers, even though it's super expensive, it's, it's actually really, really cheap. I, I was astonished. I mean, you, you talk about how the ROI on lobbying and campaign contributions in, in one estimate is like 130%. Well, well I mean, that, that seems to suggest that they're not lobbying enough, right? So if you use the same Tobin's Q argument that you made earlier, right, why aren't companies investing more <laughs> in, in lobbying and campaign contributions, especially given that the, the limits have been more or less kind of, you know. Yeah, limited. so I think there's two, there's two explanations. One is actually um, that uh, we are underestimating the amount of influence going that way because mm-hmm. um, it's, al- it's always a race, you know. We, obviously, if you want to influence the political system, you want to do it in a way which is discreet. And so you're constantly trying to find ways to channel money in a way that nobody else can measure. So in the book, I have this table where I try to chart, you know, the flow of money in politics, and there is big gaps. Um, and firms do team up together. Uh, you have industry lobbyists that are funded by all firms in, in an industry. So they would, they would actually internalize definitely uh, the price competition across firms. Now, we still compete with lobbies from other industries. So mm-hmm. in that sense, there will still be an, uh, an impact. Um, so I think we do, uh, we do undercount um, the amount of money spent on influence. Um, but it's maybe, even if it's by a factor of two, I agree that the numbers still look relatively small compared to the potential outcome. I mm-hmm. think the, the second reason then is that they actually have sharply decreasing returns, which is at some point if you channel more money, it just becomes too visible. And if it becomes too visible, it is very much self-defeating because oftentimes politicians are, you know, you can influ- you can sway them as long as they can maintain possible deniability. That they, they can say they did it because they thought it was the right thing. 
not because they were paid by lobbyists to do it. So I think increasing money flows probably is not um, is not likely to be that much more efficient. Um, and uh, but and then again, but it's I mean uh, I think the, my generation of researchers we tend to be a little bit more like uh, agnostic about some of this. We just try to see in the data what's you know so lobbies lobbying the the, the the entire lobbying process has a positive side which is mm-hmm. information provision. Uh, to get better regulations. It has a negative side, which is influence, rent seeking, and stuff like that. Let's just try to measure and figure out the balance of, and we see both in the data. And so it's only a question of which one is relatively more important. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of interesting, there's a lot of interesting stuff in the book, but I think the part that I found most eye-opening was your description of how kind of the, the, the EU is is operating and and i found that very surprising i think because the, the the narrative that most people have about the eu and, and the bureaucracy that is part of it is that that it's this intrusive um uh, overly um interventionist type of superfluous bureaucracy i mean that's sort of the the the, the you know boris johnson has has pushed that message mm-hmm. right and and i think you know, but he pushed and, it and not because he believed it. He pushed it because it was politically convenient at, at home. Right. And, and right. But he knew full well it was BS. Yeah. So, so the two things I think that that are most interesting is that, well, one thing that's distinctive about it is that it is in some ways more removed from the political process and more independent than the the regulators are in in the U.S. True. Uh, and I, and I think that that was super surprising. So, I mean, so I think part of that's because of the structure, right? Yeah, and part of it is, is, is luck, I think. So, just so if you, if you think about Europe, and go, going back to actually one thing you said earlier about the dynamics of companies, um, the one thing to be very clear is it is still the case that the U.S. the U.S. has more dynamism um, among businesses, um, and it is absolutely still the case that the U.S. is more innovative. Um, but if you try to understand the root of all of that. And so my view is, is that there are several explanations. Um, one of them is, you know, maintain strong and competitive market via pro-competition regulation and antitrust. Um, the other one is um, having innovation stemming from research lab, from universities, and the interaction between universities and um, private businesses. And the third big one is the U.S. market as a whole, where if you create a business in the U.S., you can scale up to 300 million people overnight, almost. I mean, state regulations are a little bit different in some some jobs, some sectors. You have to comply with state regulation, but by and large, in the U.S., you know, once you're incorporated, once you have a business, you can scale up to the entire country if that's convenient and relatively easy. So these are the three pillars. Strong competitive market, essentially consumer protection um, and antitrust, um, universities, and one big integrated market. My point is that over the past 20 years, the EU has made very good progress on the first one to the point that I think today it's at least as good in some cases better than the US at enforcing consumer protection. But it is, the same is not true for universities and the same is not true for the single market. So. In that sense, the fact that the U.S. continues to have, you know, an, an, an edge, like uh, it's better at innovating, is because it's still better at the other two pillars. I think it's just a pity that it lost the third one, and I hope it can yeah. regain it. Um, so in Europe, um, what happens is like the EU, so first of all, in terms of bureaucracy, this is, you know, like the number of bureaucrats in Brussels is less than just for the city of Paris. So, you know, and that's for the entire Europe. There's just one city in France. So there aren't, there aren't that many, point number one. Point number two is that we, we don't delegate a lot to the EU level. Okay? Uh, but when we do, we try to do it carefully. And so the main things, oh, the, there are a few others, but the, the main things arguably over the past 20 years that we've done is to delegate monetary policy to the central bank in Frankfurt and competition policy to the commission in the DigiComp. Okay. Um, to competition policy, with, it's broad, and also it includes like uh, fair competition between states, between uh, countries in Europe, the stated rule and stuff like that. 
So when we delegate that to the EU level, then my argument is that it actually works pretty well. Um, I think the ECB has a lot of credibility um, and has done pretty has done a much better job than all the collection of central bank would have done otherwise. And the ECB is extremely independent. Um, in fact, more independent from political pressure than the Fed. And the funny thing is, for the people who advocated for central bank independence in the US, were the conservative, mm-hmm. you know, following Milton Friedman and, 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 and people like that. So if you think that strongly independent central bank making sure inflation is under control, not yielding to political pressure, if you think that's kind of, uh, you know, a key idea from the right, from the conservative in the US, Mm -hmm. and if you see that it's been implemented in Europe to a greater extent than in the US, then what do you conclude? You conclude that the guys in Europe are much more like following Milton Friedman than the American themselves. I think that makes no sense. The reason we did it that way is because of the political economy in the game that countries play. And that's why it gets interesting, which is the reason the Europeans made a very independent central bank. It's not because they believe Milton Friedman more than the Americans. It is because that's the best solution in their setup. In fact, that's the only one they could agree on. Because you wouldn't want to be part of a union where, especially if you're a small country, where you would have no voice, and then the central bank could be in, could be swayed by the big players. And if you're Germany, and you're very attached to credibility, then if you're going to join the euro, you want the central bank to be independent. The same exact thing happened to the antitrust, uh, to the competition authority. You know, if in the old days, in in Paris or in Berlin, uh, you know, politicians could decide on mergers, could push. Um, for the kind of industrial policy that they like, could favor their champions and stuff like that. Maybe if they did it at at home, that's their problem. But now if you're going to create a single market at the EU level and you're the Netherlands or Belgium, and you're like, am I going to join a club where the two big players can bully the referee to win every game? The answer is no, right? You would not do that. And in fact, even for the big players, because even if you're Germany or France, you're not sure to win all the time. And, you know, you don't want to take the risk to be overruled by the, by the rest in a way which is, you know, against you for the wrong reason. So then what's the solution? The solution is you create a regulator which is independent. But it's not because you like independent regulators. Most politicians don't. It's because you understand that this is the, this is the only acceptable solution that would work for all the countries together. I think that was the core of the creation of, of the, either the DigiComp or the Central Bank. Now, the funny thing is that because of this, uh, because because the the birthing process of this institution w- was the way I described it, it turns out that they they became more independent indeed, and therefore they are actually less influenced by lobbyists as well. Mm-hmm. So that 20 years later, if you, you look at cases of, of lobbying against specific regulations, and they often lose in Brussels what they win in Washington, which yeah. is interesting. But I think I don't think it was planned from the beginning. I think it came as a byproduct of the political creation. That's why I, think, I tend to call it a forward fumble. Yeah, well, I mean, it goes all the way back to Jean Monnet and the formation of the uh, European Steel and, and, and Coal uh, Commission, right? Yeah. Um, where you know the idea was to create something that neither country could Absolutely. could capture. Um, but but that's because the main sort of interest divisions were along national lines, and I think you know when we created the u.s right and even when we created the 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 central bank right the federal reserve right the biggest divisions were between sort of the you know urban and and rural areas and between the different states but do you think that that over time as the the main sort of divisions in europe uh, evolve away from kind of you know regional or national divisions and more into these um, kind of industrial interest group divisions, right? Sort of producers versus consumers. Will will kind of lobbying coalitions emerge that will influence the the European Parliament and thereby influence the European Competition Authorities? Oh, that they will try. They will try for sure. There is no question. Um, the question of whether they will succeed, um, they might have some influence at the margin. Whether they would whether they would move, you know the the big machine, like whether they would have an impact. Um, it depends on on the 
the way you think of institutions. And um, the EU treaties are a bit like the American constitution. It's very hard to change. Um, and so I think changing them usually requires uh, unanimity. So uh, it's hard for me to imagine that uh, the core principle of the EU, which is really like free market consumer protection, mm-hmm. um, I think it's very hard to think that these would uh, be changed in any meaningful way because I don't see any coalition capable of doing that. So in that sense, I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, the same thing in, is in the US, you know, like the constitution in the US is the sacred document and you know it's very very hard to change it and sometimes and oftentimes for the for the good reason so i think that's that would be my forecast for europe um what's more hard what's more somewhat more difficult to forecast is how the eu will play with the rest of the world because so i think that the idea of having a free integrated market with not too much distortion at the border within europe i think that's very strong um whether at the border of Europe vis-à-vis the rest of the world, so more like the trade policy, that could change potentially more. Um, that's a bit harder to predict. So if the U.S. has sort of lost control of the U.S. model, <laughs> the Europeans are uh, kind of stole our, our secrets, uh, how, do, how do we bring them back to the U.S.? I mean, is it enough for economists like yourself to educate other um, public intellectuals, educate other economists, educate other uh, participants in this debate? Or do we need to kind of get to the, the heart of the matter and alter the way politics is done, change the way political influence in that marketplace is, is run? Yeah, so um, I think it's going to depend a little bit uh, on how ambitious we are and, and you know, what we call success. So a few things. So maybe at one extreme would be um, changes that would require agreement in Washington. Then I think it's clear to say it's hopeless, at least for the foreseeable future. The the level of dysfunctionality is so high that it's just impossible to imagine sensible regulation or sensible legislation on campaign finance or things like that. So that I think there is, I mean, just an example, like recently, the recent Congress decided that they would try to remove some of the extra funding for the IRS. Mm -hmm. When that is utterly insane, like, you know, in in the almost literal sense, like, you we know that this, this thing has been underfunded. We know that if you give one extra dollar to the IRS, they will be able to do more audits and you will, you will get back more than one dollar in tax revenue. So, well, but wait, part of, part of your part of your book is is actually saying that you know it's it's not dysfunctional and that you can kind of get what you're looking for in Washington, right? If you are a lobbyist or a political campaign person, you know you can show up with your with your checkbook and and you know get get what you want, right? I mean, isn't that sort of a functioning political marketplace in that respect? Yeah, but except that we, in that case, we do know that the vast majority of Americans would like uh, you know people to pay their fair taxes, so. Mm-hmm. That that's a, that's at the level where you know literally this is encouraging tax tax cheats and especially yeah. people who have a lot of money um, to not pay their fair taxes. I think if you were to put that in a, in a poll in the U.S., you would have a, a more overwhelming yeah. majority to, to to say that no, we should try to enforce fair payment of taxes. So um, so this is so that to me when I see that and like yeah, that if they can't even agree on <laughs> that, which is kind of putting the bar very very low. You know, so so in that sense, I things that would require Washington to reach some consensus, I think it's kind of not going to happen. Um, but there are two other things. First, the market is going to solve some of the stuff for you, um, and bygones are bygones. My reading of the tech industry of the past two years is a little bit like that, which is that um, it would have been better if we had better policy for competition and buy of things in the tech sector over the past 15 years, but Okay, that was wasted. Uh, I think that um, undoing it exposed is very costly. It's like you know unscrambling the eggs or putting the toothpaste back in the tube. It's not going to work. So you know, yes, the, the some of the merger that Facebook did uh, should not have been allowed. Now, fighting ten years to get them to 
uh, you know, separate from WhatsApp. It's like a losing battle. And, you know. But to some extent, I think that these are bygones because the market has moved on. And what we see today is Amazon competing with Google and Facebook for ad revenues. And once they start doing that, you know, that's have a huge impact. Apple deciding that privacy policy is important. And what's striking is, you know, Apple just deciding that has a hundred times more impact on the, on the value of Facebook mm -hmm. than the cumulative sum of all regulations and all antitrust right. cases in all jurisdictions around the world over the past 10 years. So like one move by Apple affects Facebook much more than the entirety of things that the DOJ, FTC, and the DG Comp in Europe has done vis-a-vis -vis Facebook. So to some extent, this is the past. I think that uh, the market is going to end up solving most of these issues for us. I think these guys are going to compete. They are going to, because that's become in their own interest to encroach in each other uh, territories. So, um, so I think that's, you can say, somewhat positive. And the, in between, you have the state level. I think at the state level, you do see some, there's, a, there's more scope for agreement and sensible policies at the state level in the US. And I think there you, you could see some improvement. And the one place where I'm still very puzzled and um, honestly a bit depressed when I see it is the regression of telecom. I mean, the fact that people pay outrageous amount of money each month just to get broadband, it's so unequal. And then, you know, like, and we saw it during the during the COVID actually, where you had kids who just had to sit by McDonald's because their parents couldn't afford to have broadband at home for their freaking homework in the US. I mean, that's such a shame, especially because it shouldn't be that. It's not that hard to do. It's not that. It's not rocket science, mm -hmm. you know. And the regulation you need to do that. It's not rocket science. And other countries have managed to do it. These are state level decisions. So I hope there that this some improvements. I think that, to me, that would be my marginal case. I think competition in the, in the tech sector is changing rapidly now. And I think that they're going to, they had maximum collusion five years ago. I don't think they're going back there. And in fact, to some extent, that's priced in today. That's part of the reason you see this sharp decrease in some of the stock values. Um, so I think that's going to more or less take care of itself. And um, we could help them along the way. We could. I'm more interested in trying to build a tool so for the next wave, we don't have only one player. Like say ChatGPT, I want to make sure there is not just Microsoft with one ChatGPT. Okay, so that's kind of, let's try to get, get that one right. The past 15 years, bygones are bygones. Um, and at the state level, I think it would be, if I was doing grassroots, I would do that at the state level. Because that, that's, you know, if you live in a state where you pay $60 per month to get broadband, you should be complaining a mm -hmm. lot. Yeah, yeah. You ask in the book at one point, like, where is the outrage, <laughs> right? Yeah. I think it's a lot of just uh, education that's needed. Look, Thomas, this book is fantastic. Uh, it's not just uh, the main narrative that we um, have dug into, but it's also the, the little nuggets of political economy and of uh, macroeconomics and of uh, uh, growth, productivity, uh, public uh, public choice. There's there's lots of little nuggets that help you to understand the tools that economists use, and also the methodologies. Right? There's a lot of interesting insight into how you actually work with the data. Yeah, yeah Data is very I, complicated. I try to be to, to show people what how things get actually done, so they get actually a view of what we actually do. Um, I think it's uh, it took that actually took a lot of time because it's hard to explain complicated stuff with simple yeah. words, but I think it's valuable. But it gives a window into what it's like to be a practicing academic economist, which is, uh, you know, it's a tough job. And so I'm glad that somebody's out there doing it. Thank, Thank you. you so much for joining me. Appreciate it. Thank the book you. is called Great Reversal, How America Gave Up on Free Markets. Thank you, Gary. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.